Hello everyone, my name is Steve Tischer with American Consulting Professionals and I'm here today to talk about practical uses of OpenBridge Modeler. And I thought this was an important topic because it's easy to get sold on the idea that you know, we can abandon all of our traditional 2D design and detailing workflows when in the reality we aren't quite there yet, but there still are a lot of practical uses that will save you a lot of time. So I broke this presentation up into three different parts. We have current uses, future uses, and then we'll finish it off with some best practices. Now one of the most obvious and easy uses of OBM is to generate our finished grade elevations like you see here. But you know what can OBM really produce? Up until a few versions ago, the only option we had was the station offset and elevation report that you see here. The issue with this is that the elevation information is listed in a vertical direction and our plan sheet deliverable is in the horizontal direction. And this used to require a fair amount of manipulation in Excel using an array to transform that data in the direction that we needed it for the plans. But now we have a report called the consolidated report. And as you can see here, this report has the elevations going in the same direction as our plan deliverable. So it cuts out all the manual manipulation that we used to have to do and comes out you know, really close to how we need it in the plans. So what kind of geometry can OBM handle? Well, the answer is you know, some pretty complex scenarios. This job here was a light rail bridge project where the track alignment controlled everything. Unfortunately, the track was on a spiral curve, which the contractor didn't want to build to, since you know, every horizontal dimension would have then uh, varies. Um, so we created a separate baseline of construction to make construction and dimensioning in the plans much easier. The bridge was still following the profile of the track though. So this means the deck was being driven vertically by the track profile and horizontally by the separate baseline of construction. Now this is a pretty complex scenario in terms of deck geometry. So here's the typical section of the bridge. As you can see, we have separate baseline of construction and the track alignment on the spiral curve, which the bridge follows its profile. And another tricky part about this deck was that the top of the track alignment had a vertical offset from the top of the deck. And just to make things really fun, we had an inverted crown that was offset from the center of the bridge as well. You know, like I said, it doesn't really get much worse than this. So, you know, what the heck's our solution here? Well, the answer is to create auxiliary alignment lines to drive the horizontal geometry with point control in OBM. So here's what the point control dialog looks like. And, you know, we can control any point of the deck template with an auxiliary alignment line. In this example, the left coping line is controlled by point six. It's kind of hard to see in that template file there, but point six is the top left point in that cut section of the deck. The inverted crown point is controlled by point 0.7, and the right coping line was controlled by point 0.1. So that was a pretty good example of what we can do in terms of controlling the deck to get finished grade elevations for some pretty complex geometry. But you know, what about controlling girder finished grade elevation points for some complex beam geometry, you know, such as girders that don't follow the alignment necessarily? So here's an example where the alignment is located here and the center line of girders are not following that alignment perfectly. The answer to this problem is the same before. You know, we use auxiliary alignment references. So the first step in that process is to go ahead and create your auxiliary alignments. Now one thing to note is that these lines must be created with the civil tools and not just the plain old smart line tools. Next, you got to open up the beam layout and add auxiliary alignments. Change the beam reference type to auxiliary alignment. And select the appropriate alignment. And now your beam lines will be following those auxiliary alignment lines as opposed to the main bridge alignment. Another way we can currently use OPM is to get substructure elevations as well. And the most common report we run is the bearing seat report. 
Now this gives you the elevations of the, the pedestals or the bearing seats, the thickness of the center, and the min thickness, as well as the depths at the corner. There has been some recently added functionality with the bearing definition. We can now add more than one bearing under a girder, and this is most useful for steel top girders and Florida U-beams. You can also add individual bearing offsets to the longitudinal and transverse direction of your bearings. And there are some limitations left for them to take care of, though, just to keep in mind. And the sloped beam seats aren't quite possible yet, although they are supposedly in development. And the bevel plates option, you know, plates can be modeled, but the thickness is specified at the center instead of giving a min thickness, which that's usually what we give in the plan. So uh, you'll have to do a little bit of math to figure out what the, the center thickness is to specify it in OBM. Another substructure elevation report we run is the pier elevation report. This gives us our left and right cap elevations, elevations at the top of column, top and bottom of footing elevations, as well as top and bottom of pile elevations. Another way we use OBM a lot is to do our vertical clearance checks. And here's an example where this really saved us. This particular bridge was a three span bridge with a bus ramp going down underneath the second span. And the issue here was that the ground line going underneath the bridge was sloped because of the ramp making the location for the vertical clearance check critical. Here's a plan and section view to show this a little better. This is the location of the section cut at the point of critical minimum vertical clearance. And here's where the PGL is. And originally when the bridge designer asked the roadway group for the ground line elevation, it was given at the PGL which had more vertical clearance than the edge of the bridge where the ground line was sloping up. And here's where the true minimum vertical clearance was. And this was discovered when the bridge was modeled in OBM and ended up being uh, critical as we had to go down in the beam size actually and redo the whole beam design in order to meet the minimum vertical clearance at that point. And you know, had this not been modeled and caught, you know, it likely would have gotten through to the construction and you know, possibly had major impacts. Another useful way we use OBM for vertical clearance checks is to check it against other structures. And the roadway group typically looks only at the superstructure depth for vertical clearance checks against other structures. But by modeling the bridge in OBM, in this case here, we identified a vertical clearance issue between the pier cap of the second level bridge and the first level bridge deck below. We were able to adjust the pier cap lengths accordingly and eliminate the conflict early on in the design process to you know, mitigate any kind of potential conflicts down the road. Another frequent way we currently use OBM is for constructability checks. In this example here, we had a pedestrian bridge going underneath a proposed bridge. Now the one that's pictured here isn't the actual bridge, but rather just an example of what the pedestrian bridge looked like. Now, although OBM doesn't handle truss bridges like this, you know, the envelope of the pedestrian bridge was modeled as a deck component in OBM to help check the clearances in this particular situation. And like the previous example, the original clearance checked just the superstructure depth to top of the pedestrian bridge. Uh, we were able to confirm that we had the necessary clearance with the underside of the pier cap as well. Another way we currently use OBM is to transfer our geometry data to LeapBridge Concrete for the design and analysis side. And this comes with a lot of benefits to it. And I would say one of the biggest benefits in my eyes is that it's just much easier to do curved bridge geometry in OBM than it is in LeapBridge Concrete. You know, if you're starting in Leap, curved geometry can only be done with that flare girder option turned on, which changes the interface quite a bit. There is a lot more manual input for you with the roadway geometry when you're doing it through that flare girder option for the curved bridge. Manual input of all your pier lines and abutments can only be defined uh, by the center line of the cap and leap as opposed to the front face of back wall. And you have a lot of manual input of all your normal conspan and fill like girder layout, material properties, and, and all the other stuff. Another advantage of transferring the OBM data to LeapBridge Concrete is that the pier geometry is much easier to define in OBM. You know, if done in Leap, you have to go manually input all the cap parameters with the elevations needing to be manually calculated. 
you have manual calculations of any column tapers and bottom elevations of the column, and manual calculation and input of all pile coordinate data, which can be extremely tedious if your footing is rotated like it is in this example. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't come with some downsides. Now the output from OBM is a leap bridge concrete file or an LBCX file, which is the standard consolidated file type even if you started the design in leap to begin with. Yeah, but there there is a downside to this consolidated file type, which is that you know, all your components are in a single file. So this means that all your beam design and conspan and peer designs and RC peer are in a single file. And because of this, only one person can access that file at a time and work on that file at a time. So you can't really divide up the design work in this case. Now this is uh, a leap bridge concrete issue, however, and it's not really related to OBM. It's just the nature of that consolidated file type that they currently support. Also, if that single file ever gets corrupt or damaged, then you end up losing everything that you were working on in that design file. Another downside to the transfer is that uh, the transfer isn't perfect all the time. Here we have the model in OBM, and here we can see what the transfer produced in Leapridge Concrete. In this case, this was an analytical model irregularity that needed to be fixed in Leapridge Concrete, but you know, it only took a couple seconds to fix this taper in the column in Leapridge Concrete, so it wasn't too bad actually. Now here are some examples of some graphical model irregularities. And since these were purely graphical, there wasn't any correction or action necessary as the analytical models were just fine. It was just some purely graphical looking types of issues. Now there are some transfer limitations that are documented in the transfer report that you should probably know about. First one is that the max haunch thickness calculated in OBM is transferred to leap bridge concrete as a uniform haunch, so that'll be a little conservative there. You might have to adjust that to uh, trapezoidal loads if you really want to dial it in. Custom beam sections made in OBM may need to have structural properties adjusted. Changes made to bearings in leakage concrete cannot be transferred back to OBM. Abutment location defined in OBM as front face of back wall is defined as center line of cap in leakage concrete. Thus, the abutment locations will appear off, but they you know, they really aren't. They're okay. Auxiliary and barrier elements are not transferred to leap. Beams can only be modeled straight in OBM with no camber, so you don't get the camber effect modeled in OBM. And the correct analytical type must be chosen in OBM for a proper transfer to leap. If your cap is sloped, you must select the multi-column option to get that cap slope to transfer correctly over into leap ridge concrete. Another way we use OBM is to model underground utilities ourselves, uh, at least until roadway and drainage start providing them on a, a regular basis. Now, there are two ways we can model them, using 3D data such as a survey file, which contains X, Y, and Z data, or 2D data such as a typical utility file, which only has X and Y data, and we have to make an educated guess as to the Z data. Clash detection is another great way we, we use OBM. The biggest and most obvious usage of this is checking for clashes between utilities and foundations. And the criteria options for the clash detection are very customizable. You know, we can check for clashes between levels, reference files, or name groups. And we can check for hard clashes where there's a direct conflict, or even do a soft clash to make sure that we have a certain amount of distance or clearance between two objects. These clash detection reports can be saved and run daily to ensure cross-discipline coordination. Now, the current use of OBM is for visualizations. An obvious use here of these visualizations are in proposals for covers, graphics, or just to help better explain a, a key concept to a, a project stakeholder. You know, we can export our model to Luminar T to create fly-through videos, high-def graphical renderings, and a lot of other things. And the key point here is that you know we're, we can use one model in a lot of different ways, saving us from uh, rework in a lot of areas. Now, the last main current use for OBM is quantity takeoffs. OBM does a very good job of breaking down the quantities into the different categories for you. We have superstructure quantities broken out by deck and haunch concrete, beam lengths and diaphragms, substructure quantities which are broken out by cap, column, 
footer, cheek wall, beam seats, and piles. And then you have your miscellaneous quantities such as bearings, barrier wall, and more. OBM does have a customizable material library that can be cost loaded to produce quick cost estimates for you as well. So we have a lot of really great current uses of OBM, but what about the, some of the future uses of OBM? And the biggest one that everyone wants to know about is using the model for 2D planes production. So how close are we to being able to produce 2D planes from the 3D model? Well, the answer is closer than probably most people think. You know, the tools already exist to cut sections in the 3D model and reference those into 2D plans. It's just a matter of understanding what that workflow is, what the quirks are of it, and how to manage those quirks. So what's holding us back? Well, the main thing is just certain geometry that OBM can't currently produce you know, out of the box by itself. You know, an example of this would be piers that have varying form liner or rustification details like you see here. You know, we can do the straight section of the rustification, but when it starts varying radially, that's when we hit the limitations of the out-of-the-box OBM. You know, it is important to note, though, that we can achieve this level of detail with general microstation modeling tools and just bring those uh, into OBM as a custom peer or parametric cell. So it is possible. It just requires a little bit more work than the normal peers. Another thing that's difficult or not very practical to do in OBM currently is tapering undersides of decks like you see here. And another one is our thick and dense slab detail here in Florida. Now there are some enhancements that are coming down the road here, hopefully before the end of the year, that will make all of this non-typical geometry much easier to model though. Now there are some important concepts that we'll need to get our heads wrapped around which may be new to us depending on our current plans production workflows. The first one is model types and to know what the different types are. So we have the design model which you can think of as our model space if you're more familiar with AutoCAD. Uh, and This is where all of our design geometry is stored. Next we have the drawing model, which is the space we use to reference in our design model and apply annotations, dimensions, callouts, and other design aspects. And lastly we have our sheet model, which is kind of our, our paper space in a sense for the old AutoCAD users. And this is this model is used to lay out and compose our final annotated plan sheet. So what are the differences between these workflows? Well, traditionally we have only used one model type for the most part and, that is, and that's the design model. The new 3D to 2D plans production workflow will require us to use all three model types in MicroStation or OBM. Another important concept that you'll have to put your, some thought into is your model management. So what does our traditional model management workflow look like in, in 2D? Well, we have a, a DGN file and inside that DGN file is a design model and in the design model, we have all of our native geometry, a reference file geometry, annotations and callouts, our notes, and our border is usually scaled to fit uh, the content that's in that sheet or in that design model. And as far as printing goes, we usually just print from the design model. So, what does our model management look like in a, a model centric workflow going from 3D to 2D? Well, it depends on the content of the sheet. Uh, we're producing, and there are a few different workflows that we'll likely encounter. The first one is a sheet with a single cut reference on it. Another one is a sheet with multiple cut references on it. And the last one is a sheet with cut references within other cut references. So the best way I found to kind of visualize how this is going to work is with the flowchart here. And it might be a little difficult to see some of this, but we'll try to use the laser pointer here and point some of this out. Now, in this flowchart here, the color-coded boxes here, the blue represents a, a DGN file. Again, that's your, your DGN container file. Black is going to be a design model. Gray is a drawing model. And white is a sheet model here. So in this 3D to 2D workflow in terms of how we manage those different sheet types we talked about with a single cut reference, multiple cut references, and cut references within cut references. It's always going to start with this master 3D model. This is a, we'll call this a composition model. So you'll have a, 
a DGN file here and your master 3D model DGN and there's actually nothing that's going to be natively stored in this design model that's in this DGN file it's only going to be reference data so all your models from you know, bridges, roadway, whatever it is you want to reference in your plans this is all just referenced into this design file here again nothing native in this file and then from there for that first one, that typical section file we would just create a typical section DGN file reference in that master 3D model into that typical section DGN file and re we're referencing that into the design model in here and this is where we're going to make all of our uh, cuts, any kind of cuts that we need to make, any section cuts to produce the, the 2D files are going to be done in this design file here and then those section cuts are then going to get referenced into this drawing model here and in the drawing model this is going to be where we do all of, our, all of our annotation, all of our dimensioning and callouts and things like that and then that typical section drawing model will then get referenced and placed on a, a sheet model here and this is where you're, you're producing your final plan sheet so that's pretty simple to follow for you know a sheet with just one section cut that's referenced onto it that you know that superstructure deck typical section you're just going to be having that DGN file with the design model this is the design model here is where you're going to be making all your section cuts in this case it's just one section cut that gets referenced into a drawing model and then that gets referenced into a sheet model but you know what if we have something a little bit more complicated here like that footing detail sheet which had multiple section cuts referenced onto it so this, the beginning is still the same you know you're just going to have a, a DGN file called whatever you want to call it so in this case it's going to be footing details DGN and that's just the DGN container file and inside that DGN file the first thing is going to be the design model with no native geometry it's just going to be referencing in that master 3D composite model here and then in there in that, de that design file that's again where we're going to be making any of our section cuts and we're going to have you know, three section cuts in this case here um, showing the footing plan the footing elevation and then the, another footing or column bar you know, section view here so we're going to have three different section cuts in this model here this design model and those are going to produce three separate drawing models here and again the drawing models where we're going to do all of our annotation dimensioning and then we just simply get to reference each one three of these drawing models into a single sheet model to produce our final plan sheet and the last one here where we have section cuts within section cuts again starts off the same you know I have a pure sheet that has some you know, front elevation some plan views and some section cuts on it um, so we're just going to have that DGN container file in this case you know peer.dgn or whatever you want to call it and in there it's going to be your design model again with no native geometry it's simply just referencing in the master 3D composition model and this is where I'm making my first cut and the first cut is just going to be simply to produce my front at my peer front elevation view here and then in this peer front elevation view you know that's part of what I'm going to put on the plan sheet here so I'll be making any annotations and dimensions and things like that that I need in there but I'm also going to put uh, some cut some section cuts on this 2D file here and those those section cuts are going to produce you know my column section cutout one my column section cutout two my cap section cut and my peer side elevation so so all four of these section cuts here are actually done in this peer front elevation 2D drawing model and this is where the the cut references within cut reference kind of comes from here so all these cut references are done on this cut reference file here and then each one of these drawing models all get referenced into this sheet model here to produce our final plan sheet So another great use that I originally had in here as a future use but has since become more of a current use actually is the modeling of all of our rebar in 3D using the Pro Concrete tools inside OBM. Now here are just a few examples of the 3D rebar detailing that we've done recently and this first one is just uh, some footing and column reinforcing. Here we have uh, some straddle bent reinforcing and here's some pretty complex pier reinforcing and just a close-up of that peer reinforcing there again. Now I will say this about the rebar modeling tools 
they were originally designed to model reinforcing for more like the vertical buildings world with nice, easy, straight plumb geometry. Um, but we can really make the tools they provide work well for us in our bridge geometry as well. And you know, I can pretty confidently say that you know we can model any reinforcement that we encounter in our our bridge world here. There are three main rebar modeling workflows. We have parametric dialogue-based modeling, and these are the footing, column, beam, and slab tools. Again, these were made for the, the vertical buildings world originally, but we can still use a lot of them to knock out uh, a large percentage of our rebar modeling really quickly uh, most of the time. Next, we have the manual modeling method, and this is manually creating guidelines and using tools such as a regular dispatch and single rebar distribution. And lastly, we have the face-based method, uh, which is used to create, you create extractive faces from the concrete elements to create guidelines we can use to model our rebar. Now, the advantage of this is that the rebar reacts dynamically to changes to the concrete elements. There are still some enhancements that probably need to happen to make this a little bit more practical in method, but it's uh, a good use in a lot of cases currently, and it's you know, only going to get better down the road. Another future use, which since the creation of this presentation has actually turned into uh, current use again, is the use of the iTwin design review. So this is a web-based platform that is designed to be a way for us to QC a 3D model. And here, you know, you can make comments, and the comments actually attach to the model elements. You can even assign and update statuses of comments, similar to how you can do in a, a Bluebeam review of PDF. You can open up a profile view, cut cross sections, take measurements, and turn on and off different levels and models within the, the design model here. So I'll close out the presentation with a couple of best practice tips that I think you might find useful. And the first one I'm going to cover is trimming unneeded data from your model. So a common issue that almost everyone comes across uh, to their alignment file is that it's typically much bigger than the bridge area and much bigger than you actually need. And the same goes for the terrain model. You know, it's going to be much larger than the area that they care about, which is around the bridge. So what I like to do is create a clip shape of my area of interest in a separate DGN file and reference that into my OBM model. So the first thing I'll do is I'll select my alignment file that I want to clip. Clip the reference using the clip shape reference that I created and referenced into my model here. Then turn off my clip shape reference. And now I'm left with a nice trimmed down alignment, which helps when doing like the zoom extents and locating your bridge, actually. Another thing I always try to do is separate my files as much as possible. Uh, now this reduces the chance of creating a file access choke point during production. So in this particular file, I have all these different files referenced here. And we have the alignment file in there, my clip shape file that I just talked about, an existing ground survey, existing bridge survey, my 3D utilities that I modeled, 3D right-of-way file, all the roadway models that are produced by the roadway group, and some other bridge models here. Now, like I said, just keeping all these models as separate as possible will reduce you know, what I refer to as those uh, production choke points or areas where you might need to be working on the same thing at the same time, but if they're all in one model, then only one person can be in the model working on it. Uh, but if they're broken up, then you can have multiple people working on those different aspects of the models. Another best practice that I found uh, to be extremely useful, especially in the early phases of projects or design build projects, is to add the date to the end of the alignment file name. So what date am I adding to the, the file name? Well, it's the date when the alignment file was created and the data was pulled from our Geopack file. And this is important to do as it helps you know if you need to update your alignment file after roadway changes the alignment or profile. And this also makes it much easier to move the bridge to that updated alignment. Now, the best practice that I've kind of come to realize over the years is using the right tool to lay out the support lines on a curved alignment. Now, we typically try to make our end bends and piers parallel to each other on a curved concrete girder bridge so that the beam lengths are all the same, at least as much as we can. So what are the potential challenges of doing this in OBM? Well, if you use the, the middle point or the multi-tool 
placement methods, uh, your beam lengths will likely not be the same because those placement methods require you to specify a uh, support line skew angle. And unless your angle input is you know, six or more decimal places long, your lengths are going to end up being different for your girders. So what's the solution? Well, it's just to use the, the parallel pier line placement method instead. So how do you do this? Well, it's important to note that you have to set the support line you wish to copy parallel first, then use the parallel pier line placement method, and just specify the offset amount that gets you to the desired station for that support line. The last little tip I'll share is laying out corded girders on a curved alignment. Now, typically, you know, we reference point for laying out exterior girders and OBM is the overhang distance at the beginning and the ends of the beam. And this can lead to some pretty wonky looking overhang numbers because, you know, we're on a curved alignment. So what's the best way to lay out corded girders on a curved alignment? And the answer is the long cord method. With the long cord method, OBM will draw a line between the points of intersection of the alignment and the support lines. And the offset distances you provide for your girders just reference that corded line, that long cord line. And this ensures that all your girders come out perfectly parallel and lets you deal with much nicer numbers as opposed to those overhang distances we saw earlier. Well, that's all I have for this presentation. I do have a YouTube channel with a lot more in-depth open bridge modeler videos. If you want to check that out, you can open up your camera app on your phone and scan this QR code to send you right over to that channel. If anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them at this time.